Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Fifty years ago today, George Catlett Marshall completed his service to our nation and to the world. We've gathered here to celebrate his life, his career, and his legacy of selfless service. General Marshall always answered the call. Today we are pleased to have with us three great Americans who have also answered the call to public service throughout their lives. They are the current holders of the three positions that Marshall held. Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, Secretary of Defense Robert M. Gates, and Army Chief of Staff General George W. Casey, Jr. Thank you for your presence and your willingness to be here. We are deeply honored that you are here to help us honor the legacy of General Marshall. We are pleased. We are equally pleased to be here in a building that perpetuates Marshall's name and legacy in, a, in the wing that is named for him. Built in the 1930s to house the War Department, the building was outgrown before it was finished. Yet it has served as home for almost 70 years for the State Department. We are also pleased and honored to have with us today many of the ambassadors and top diplomats from Marshall Plan countries and from key U.S. allies. The Marshall Plan has been called the greatest humanitarian act in history. We know it was more than that. It was a way to win the peace and to lay the foundation for international cooperation that continues today. We are equally pleased to have with us members of General Marshall's family. While the rest of the world saw Marshall as an iconic figure of Olympian proportions, his grandchildren knew him as a kind-hearted grandfather who loved fishing, gardening, and spending time with him. The Marshall Foundation is grateful for the support of its friends who have helped underwrite today's events and other events being held this month to celebrate General Marshall. With special recognition to BAE Systems and General Dynamics for their generous support, we thank them and all the other fr friends listed in the program for their commitment to the Marshall legacy. <laughs> Today we honor the memory of General Marshall, not only for his service to our nation and to the world, but for his commitment to integrity, courage, and candor. Historian David Abshire, who is with us here today, said that the most stunning characteristic about Marshall is that he was not a leader of blind ambition, but that he was an unparalleled servant leader, a leader who never, never thought of himself. It is that character that speaks to us today and reminds us why it is important to keep Marshall's memory and his vast accomplishments alive. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Patrick F. Kennedy, Under Secretary of Management and our host for today. Ambassador Kennedy has the well-known reputation of being the State Department's manager's manager, the guy who makes things run and happen, a person for all crises and someone you would want to have with you when difficult challenges arise. He is the kind of person Marshall would have had high on his staff. We are grateful to Ambassador Kennedy and his team for helping us to arrange all the details of this event, and even more for coming here today to introduce Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Ambassador Kennedy. Thank you very much, Brian. It is a true pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you here today to the State Department as we celebrate the legacy of George Marshall. After leaving office, President Truman was once asked whom he thought had made the greatest contribution during the previous 30 years, and he replied simply, George C. Marshall. Therefore, we felt it especially fitting that in this building, named for Harry S. Truman, we now have a wing and a state-of-the-art conference facility dedicated to George Marshall, the George C. Marshall Conference Center. As Secretary of State, author of the Marshall Plan, and Secretary of Defense, George Marshall embodied all of the elements of national power, diplomacy, development, and defense. Shortly after her confirmation, Secretary Clinton introduced her concept of smart power, a concept levering, leveraging all the tools of national power, a concept that guides many in this room as we seek to implement our foreign policy priorities, and one that I believe 
George Marshall would also have espoused and endorsed. It is now my pleasure and honor to welcome to the podium the champion of smart power, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Oh, thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Ambassador Kennedy, who well deserves the uh, introduction and accolade that uh, Brian uh, presented in calling him to the podium. Uh, I am delighted to welcome all of you to the Benjamin Franklin Room here on the eighth floor of the State Department. And it is a special privilege uh, that uh, we are engaged in uh, not only honoring the legacy of George C. Marshall, but honoring the service of a present day patriot, uh, someone who carries on the ideals of a great leader of the past. Uh, with all of its challenges, the world today is uh, looking to our predecessors for instruction and inspiration. And more often than not, uh, many of us uh, find ourselves uh, turning to uh, uh, George C. Marshall for both. General Marshall knew that our national interests are inseparable from the interests of people everywhere, that we best bolster our security by advancing our values, and that we best protect ourselves by looking beyond ourselves. When General Marshall first described the outlines of what would become the Marshall Plan in a speech at Harvard in 1947. He urged Americans to embrace a policy directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. He knew how much he was asking of a nation scarred and exhausted by years of war. The aid we gave to Europe under the Marshall Plan would, as a percentage of national income, amount to more than $500 billion today. As he said in closing that day, with a willingness on the part of our people to face up to the vast responsibility which history has clearly placed upon our country, the difficulties I have outlined can and will be overcome. Thanks to George Marshall's leadership, those challenges were overcome in that time. The Marshall Plan was as bold and visionary a demonstration of American leadership as any in our history. And it is a model today as we face up to our own vast responsibility. I often think about what would have happened in today's world if General Marshall and President Truman had said to a nation that was ready to turn from war and immerse itself in the day-to-day -day activities of just ordinary life, well, we know how much you've given and how much you've sacrificed, but we're going to ask you to continue to do what must be done to protect and preserve the peace that you have won. Just imagine the talk show hosts and cable TV and all the others rising up and declaiming in great uh, passion that this is unbelievable. How can we be asked to do this? I somehow have a feeling that George Marshall would have figured out a way through even that. There didn't seem to be a challenge that he ever faced that he couldn't determine a way forward. Well, today, we are remembering that at the end of the Harvard speech, the university's president compared General Marshall to another great soldier and statesman, George Washington. Looking to our past and perhaps presaging the future of the need to continually regenerate the source of leadership, the examples that mean so much as we now look our way toward meeting the challenges of today. Well, I think we have such a leader and the man we honor, uh, namely Secretary Bob Gates, a public servant uh, par excellence. Uh, he has uh, a humility and an aptitude for quiet but strong leadership. 
Uh, he has a devotion to the men and women of the United States military. And he is a public servant with a martial view of the world. A Secretary of Defense committed to a brand of American leadership that draws on all the sources of our strength, fostering cooperation and spreading prosperity while keeping our military strong and ready. I personally am very grateful to have a voice like Secretary Gates's at the Pentagon calling for more support for the State Department, for strengthening our capacity for development and diplomacy. Uh, Bob is a statesman who shares General Marshall's judgment that the only way to truly win a war is to prevent it in the first place. So I am delighted that the Marshall Foundation, which has done such great work to keep the lessons and the spirit of General Marshall's leadership alive, has chosen to honor Secretary Gates with this prestigious award. As the United States faces up to the responsibility history has placed upon us once again, I could ask for no better partner and America could ask for no better leader. I'm now honored to introduce our next speaker, another one of our nation's most respected public servants. Brent Scowcroft has had a distinguished career serving our nation in the Air Force and as a national security advisor to both Presidents Ford and the first President Bush. He remains a source of advice and counsel to many of us in government today. He works with us on foreign policy and defense matters for which we are very grateful. He has also studied export control reforms, and we look forward to drawing on his ideas emanating from a study that he has just chaired on this important issue. And this is a job, by the way, that he inherited from Bob Gates. Uh, so we know that we've got two great minds at work on it. It is now my great pleasure, both personally and on behalf of the State Department, to welcome our friend, Brent Scowcroft. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Madam Secretary, for those kind and generous words. I first really got to know Secretary Clinton when she was Senator Clinton, and we used to go to the Verkunda Conference tomorrow. That's a wonderful name. It's now the Munich Security Conference. Verkunda is much, much nicer. And I learned then to appreciate her keen instincts and grasp for strategy and state, as in great state politics, and her skill in integrating the two. That talent has been amply on display for the past several months, and we all thank you. It's a great honor and a deep pleasure for me to participate in this tribute to Secretary of Defense Bob Gates on two accounts. As I've said before to many in this audience, uh, General George Marshall has long been a hero and a role model for me. His talents and character, both as Army Chief of Staff, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, represent for me the highest order of achievement in service to our great country. And Bob Gates, a dear and close friend, for me comes as close as anyone could in emulating both the quality and the characteristics of Marshall. The quiet but determined and nonpartisan dedication to country, the deeply analytical approach to problem solving, and the advancement of the interests of the country above all LA. Uh, above all else. And now I want to tell you about the real Bob Gates. Well, not everything about the real Bob Gates. But I hired him from the CIA during the Nixon administration based on his reputation as a clear-eyed analyst of Russia and the Soviet Union. Bob lived up to his reputation fully on that, and 
I became impressed with his deep analytical qualities and his strength of character. And we sort of stayed in touch, as people do in Washington, in and out of government. Uh, and I was a close witness to the depth of his character when he was nominated by President Reagan to be DCI in 1987. Unfortunately, that was not to be. That nomination became entangled in the Iran-Contra issue, and Bob was darkly accused of participating in, or at least being aware of, the Iran-Contra affair. Now, I knew something about that, being a member of the Tower Board which investigated that, and so I knew what the facts were. Now, when his nomination became bogged down that way, Bob is one in one of his many acts of loyalty, patriotism, and dignity. Withdrew his nomination to save his president from further discomfort and his country from further stress and turmoil. Uh, not trying to clear his name by standing up and refuting him, but simply doing what a true servant of his country would do. When George Bush Sr. became president, he asked me to be his national security advisor. I immediately thought of Bob as my deputy. President Bush was enthusiastic. But I ran into serious problems on the House or on the Senate Intelligence Committee, where the chairman and the ranking member said, no, Bob Gates is essential to the Central Intelligence Agency and can't leave. It took great persuading to convince them that this move would increase Bob's chances later on to serve his country uh, in an even deeper way. As my deputy, Bob was a complete alter ego and made what for me was an impossible job manageable. So much so that I hated to let him go after two years when President Bush wanted to nominate him again to be DCI. That, of course, had been a part of my plan all around, but it was still hard to <laughs> lose him. Uh, Bob Beth thus became the only person in the CIA ever to go from entry level to DCI. After the Bush administration, Bob was allowed a few years of ease, speaking, making money, but uh, it was not to be for long. In 1999, uh, I was in search for uh, President Bush's school at A&M of a dean for the Bush School at A&M. And I asked Bob if he would fill in as interim dean for a couple of months, for one or two days a month, just to have somebody figurehead there uh, while we uh, conducted the search for a dean. And he, unfortunately for him, said yes. Uh, a couple of months at two days a month turned into three years almost full time. Uh, by the end of which he had done such an outstanding job and so endured himself to Texas A&M that he was asked to become president of the university. And next, at a time of special difficulty, for the Bush 43 administration, President Bush asked him to become Secretary of Defense. Again, with that simple dedication to his country, he responded once again. And responded so brilliantly that President Obama asked him to help him 
by staying on help him steer the country through the difficult and complex problems facing the country. That to me is a rare step in our political system on the part of both men and speaks volumes about the character and talents of the person we honor today. I am confident that George Marshall would look down with pleasure at what we're about to do now. Thank you very much. Brent, thank you for that <clears throat> gracious and mostly factual introduction. <laughs> I've known Brent for uh, more than three and a half decades since I first went to work for him at the National Security Council in the early summer of 1974. As I recall at that time, President Nixon's final appeal in the Watergate case was being heard by the Supreme Court. Working for Brent in the White House at that time was sort of like being a deckhand on the Titanic. <laughs> As you can also imagine, Nixon's NSC wasn't exactly a hotbed of admiration for the Department of State. A foggy Bottom was viewed as a bunch of guys in striped pants with last names for first names, <laughs> who occasionally took time out of their busy days to implement the president's foreign policy. As they say in Washington, my views have matured over the years. <laughs> so on that note, let me also thank Secretary Clinton for her kind words and for her strong leadership of the Department of State. Uh, it is a real pleasure working with her. And of course, my gratitude to all those uh, who have made today's celebration of uh, George Marshall's life possible, and especially his family members who are with us. And my apologies for not being able to stay with you for lunch. Uh, President Obama is visiting Texas A&M this afternoon and I think felt he needed some cover. <laughs> Receiving this award is a true honor. The placement of my name anywhere near that of George Marshall is also incredibly humbling. That said, I will admit we share at least one trait, our repeated failures to retire from public service. <laughs> Army Chief of Staff was to be Marshall's final job in the government. Then President Truman called him at his beloved farm in Leesburg and asked him to be special envoy to China, mere days into a much-deserved retirement. After that came Secretary of State, and when Marshall later agreed to be Secretary of Defense, it was pitched as a six-month deal. He stayed twice as long, and it sounds familiar. You know, in some ways, the United States Army has trouble with General Marshall's legacy. Last year, I told the graduating class at Virginia Military Institute, General Marshall's alma mater, that I enjoy teasing West Pointers about the lack of a statue of Marshall at West Point. I tell them that surely Army General, acknowledged to be the architect of victory in World War II, deserves more than a plaque at one of the entrances to West Point's football stadium. George Marshall is one of my personal heroes for many reasons beyond his inability to retire. His portrait hangs behind my desk in the Pentagon. And when I speak to students at our war colleges and the military academies, I invoke him as an example of the kind of leader everyone should aspire to be. The apotheosis of unshakable loyalty combined with the courage 
and the integrity to tell superiors things they didn't always want to hear. From General Black Jack Pershing to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Secretary Clinton told us about, sec about General Marshall's accomplishments as Secretary of State. And after lunch, General Casey will talk about his role as Army Chief of Staff. In brief, I suppose it was a noteworthy accomplishment that he expanded the Army from less than 200,000 soldiers to more than 8 million in only a few years and crushed the Nazi and Japanese war machines. And perhaps it was also noteworthy that he managed to save Berlin, advocate the creation of NATO, and rebuild an entire continent's economy. But I might suggest that one of his tasks as Secretary of Defense was even more daunting a challenge that has eluded a number of secretaries and led to untold frustrations and complications throughout the decades. And that, of course, is getting the Departments of State and Defense to work together. <laughs> Marshall's skill in navigating the bureaucratic trenches probably had its roots in his austere personality. Marshall once said, I cannot afford the luxury of sentiment. Mine must be cold logic. Sentiment is for others. When FDR once called him George, Marshall corrected him, General Marshall. His, biography said, his biographer said he was impatient of verbiage, of protocol, and of the polite palaver that often lubricates the wheels of administration. And in a city that has, on rare occasion, elevated showmanship over substance, Marshall eschewed pomp and circumstance. The journalist Alastair Cook once described him as performing his duties with all the ardor of a certified public accountant. <laughs> that man was, in many respects, a manifestation of his intellect, of his deeply contemplative nature. This is not to say he was always correct, even when he had thought through an issue. Some of his early views on efforts to save Britain at the expense of arming America were flawed. And as in all wars, there were mistakes and setbacks, both strategically and operationally. But more often than not, on the big things, those that really mattered, Marshall's strategic vision yielded profound wisdom about his country, about the world, and about the nature of man. In the immediate aftermath of World War I, he knew already that the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month signified only an interlude between great and furious storms. So he started writing down the names of all competent officers he met in his various posts. And years later, those officers would lead the American Army in World War II. Then only three months later, after the guns had fallen silent in 1945 and that great tragedy had ended, he warned that maintaining the peace required addressing, in his words, the pittance of food, of clothing, and coal and homes in Europe, the intellectual seeds that would in time grow into the Marshall Plan. His foresight was, I believe, rooted in his acceptance of man as a flawed creature and an international landscape that reflected that stark and unfortunate reality, truths we can still absorb today. There were no holidays from history for Marshall. As he noted, tragic consequences followed whenever humanity walked blindly or ignored the lessons of the past. That was never George Marshall's course in life. His was, thankfully, a life of action driven by purpose. In a special convocation speech to Princeton students in 1948, Marshall exhorted them, the development of a sense of responsibility for world order and security the development of a sense of the overwhelming importance of the country's acts and failures to act in relation to world order and security. These, in my opinion, are the great musts for your generation. And I would add, for future generations as well. And his willingness to serve America and the world throughout the great travails of the 20th century, George Marshall more than affirmed the worth of these musts and the purposes to which he devoted his life. And in persisting in this affirmation for all his living days, he made of himself an ideal that we should all aspire to emulate. Thank you very much for this high honor.
I wanted to wish you a good afternoon and reminding current and future generations of the many accomplishments of the George Marshall and celebrating his legacy, which are both important parts of the Marshall Foundation. That celebration is robust and ongoing and it takes many forms, such as today's event, to commemorate George Marshall in a modern context. Through our museum, library, archives, and programmatic outreach, we extend the mission of the foundation to students, scholars, and others around the world. George Marshall's legacy reaches across generations and across continents. We see that in the thousands of visitors of all ages who come to our museum in Lexington each year to learn about Marshall. Scholars visit for days and weeks to read original source materials from more than a million pages in our research library. Tens of thousands of students, scholars and others, visit our website each week and download digitized material on Marshall and his era. The Marshall Foundation remains the proud custodian of the majority of Marshall-related material and, just as important, remains the guardian of the man's remarkable legacy. I can speak for my colleagues on the Board of Trustees and those members of our Council Advisors when I say we accept our charge solemnly and respectfully. We are constantly seeking new ways to bring Marshall, his character and vision, into the present day. As the Foundation looks forward, it sees an opportunity to facilitate stronger business government relations using the Marshall Plan as a model for post-conflict and post-regime change reconstruction. Together, business leaders, policymakers, and regional experts to recommend solutions to economic problems and suggest methods to deploy public resources. It is one of several international initiatives that comprise the Foundation's work. Above all, Marshall was a teacher. The Foundation continues Marshall's legacy in that capacity in different ways. For 32 years, the Foundation has hosted an annual seminar on national security and leadership for the top Army ROTC cadets in the country. Nearly 10,000 college seniors have participated and many are now flag rank officers. The foundation began a similar program five years ago for top U.S. Air Force ROTC cadets and looks forward to involving Naval ROTC. We know the leadership lessons of Marshall are timeless and we readily share those lessons with the next generation of leaders in uniform. U.S. Army Chief of Staff General George Casey knows those lessons well. He has been a key participant in our Army ROT seminar during his time as Army Chief of Staff. General Casey is a learned, articulate, and highly experienced and capable leader. Like George Marshall before him, he has responded to the need for more military personnel who are better trained and prepared for an evolving mission. General Casey has dealt with the unending challenge of maintaining the spirit among America's fighting men and women operating in multiple theaters who are called upon to serve for longer periods. The demands of his job are relentless, yet, as we have seen with the Army ROTC seminars, General Casey remains an inspirational leader for the young men and women of today's Army. We are pleased and honored by his presence here today Please join us in welcoming General George W. Casey, Jr., the 36th Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, so you've seen the Secretary of State, you've seen the Secretary of Defense, and now you get me. <laughs> and drawing the after lunch speaker slot is just another reminder that in Washington, you are never too senior to be junior. <laughs> uh, great to have you all here. And, and it's, it, I, I tell you, I have had a lot of, a, a lot of fun reading up on, on Marshall again. Uh, and, and he's just, just a fascinating leader. 
Uh, so it's great for me to just spend some time with you here talking about his role as, as the Army Chief of Staff. Uh, there have been 36 Army Chiefs of Staff since the turn of the last century. And every day I'm reminded how we as serving chiefs stand on the shoulders of our predecessors. And there's two other predecessors here today of my predecessors. Uh, General Scheimeyer. <laughs> Shai in 1980 uh, went to the President and Congress and said, Mr. President, your Army's hollow. And with that, we began the resurgence of the U.S. Army after Vietnam. And General Carvona. Carl continued that transformation, and really more than any other leader was the architect of the Army that was so victorious in, in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So th thank you for that. Now, when I think of Marshall, I'm struck by his over four decades of military service and by how our knowledge of that service help, it, help us understand what it means to be a soldier in the United States Army. I'm struck by his selfless service. I'm struck by his respect for civilian control over the military, by his absolute competence, and by his immutable sense of duty. In the service of his country, Marshall always was a soldier first and a soldier at his very heart. For most of us, promotions to positions of greater responsibility are milestones to celebrate. On the 1st of September, 1939, when George Marshall was sworn in as the Army Chief, it was a tough day. In his own world, words, he recalled, my day of induction into office was monumentous with the starting of what appears to be a world war. And he was right. In an Army at dawn, Rick Atkinson put the looming crisis that began that first day in perspective. The 1st of September, 1939 was the first day of a war that would last 2,174 days. On that day, Germany attacked Poland with 60 divisions, unleashing a war that would put Hitler in command of Europe within a matter of months. It was a war that would claim an average of 27,600 lives every day. It was a war that was staggering in its scope and enormous in its consequences. When it began, as was said earlier, the United States Army had less than 200,000 soldiers. In terms of size and combat power, it ranked 17th, just behind Romania. Compared with Germany's 160 divisions, the United States Army could field five. So few of us can doubt that that chief of staff of the Army, of that Army, uh, had a lot on his plate that very first day in office. And we're here today in part uh, because over the next six year, years, uh, George Marshall survived that first day in office and did a remarkable job for this Army and for this country. In, in those six years, Marshall oversaw the dramatic expansion of the Army and built our, uh, the forces that were ultimately victorious in the war. And he also played a key role in running the war and in crafting a unified global strategy for victory. In the deliberations of the Combined Chiefs of Staff, the strategy-making body of the Anglo-American Alliance, it was Marshall who represented the American military position. He was, if not in reality, or in reality, if not in title, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So basically, he'd be doing my job and Mike Mullen's job uh, during the six years of war. The thing I, about Marshall was he always saw the big picture. He realized that victory over the axis required balancing lots of different requirements. The Allies, industry, the Air and Naval Services, and not just the Army. He was much broader, broader than that. Perhaps one of Marshall's greatest legacies is the, is the example that he set for the character and competence of a military professional in a time of crisis. This can be seen, I believe, in his interactions with two American political institutions, the Congress, and the presidency. Marshall engaged Congress with admirable, admirable energy. In the spring and summer of 1940, he spent 21 days 
testifying in 15 separate hearings. In one critical week, he made seven trips to the Capitol. Marshall understood Congress and, in turn, members regarded his position as representing the national interests. Speaker of the House Sam Rayburn attested to Marshall's credibility and to his integrity. Here's what he said. Of all the men who ever testified before any committee on which I served, there is no one who has the influence General Marshall has. When he takes the witness stand, we forget whether we're Democrats or Republicans. We remember we are in the presence of a man who is telling the truth. We should all do so well on the Hill. Uh, Marshall's relationship with his Commander-in-Chief is also an interesting one, but it underscores Marshall's respect for the fundamental principle of civilian control over the military. When his Commander-in-Chief asked him at a meeting one day, don't you think so, George? Marshall answered, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but I don't agree with you at all. And that was the last time Roosevelt ever called the General George in public. It wasn't Marshall's disposition that made him a trusted advisor. It was his candor, and it was his integrity. And of course, there were disagreements. The biggest one came in 1942 in the debate over whether to launch an Allied operation into Africa or to conserve resources for a cross-channel crossing. Against the advice of Marshall, Roosevelt sided with Winston Churchill and ordered the torch landings in November that year. While Marshall strongly disagreed with the President, he fully supported the President when it came to planning and executing that operation. True to form, the General later admitted that we fail to see that the leader in a democracy must keep the people entertained. That may say, sound like the wrong word, he said, but it conveys the thought. People demand action. In this case, Americans needed to see Allied progress against Germany to strike back, to strike back sooner rather than later. The President saw this crucial political consideration, whereas Marshall did not. His credibility in the eyes of the President only grew as the war went on. Deciding to keep Marshall in Washington rather than to send him off to command the Allied armies for the invasion of Europe, Roosevelt admitted to Marshall, I feel I could not sleep at night with you out of the country. Which brings me to another legacy of Marshall, his lifetime of selfless service which has been acknowledged today in his service as the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and Chief of Staff of the Army. Marshall probably would have been content if his last piece of official correspondence was the letter of resignation that he wrote to Harry Truman on August 20th, 1945. It's typical. It said, now that hostilities have terminated, hostilities have terminated, the demobilization of our Army is underway, the major military decisions have been taken, and post-war planning is at an advanced state. He'd come a long way since September 1st. He said, I feel free to propose my relief as Chief of Staff. I've been on duty in the War Department continuously for seven years, six of those as Chief of Staff. Aware of the wear and tear on the job, I am certain it would be advantageous to make a change. As was said earlier, the President reluctantly granted Marshall his wish, and the general retired in, in November. But one week later, one week later, the phone rang. Marshall answered, it was Truman. There was a political crisis in China, and the country was on the brink of civil war. General, I want you to go to, I want you to, go to China for me. Yes, Mr. President. Selfless service. Marshall never even took time to write his memoirs. He apparently turned down an offer of over a million dollars by the Saturday Evening Post to tell his story because he didn't want to embarrass the statesmen and other generals that he'd work with. His focus was on his country and his duty. In closing, I'm going to quote from Winston Churchill, who always could turn a phrase, but he captured Marshall's legacy as the indispensable organizer of victory, as a professional soldier, and as a selfless public servant. He wrote to Marshall after the Allied victory in Europe. It has not fallen to your lot to command the great armies. You have had to create them, organize them, and inspire them under your guiding hand. There has grown in my breast through all these years of mental exertion a respect and admiration for your courage and massive strength. 
which has been a real comfort to your fellow toilers of whom I hope it will be recognized that I was one. High and well-deserved acclaim for America's greatest soldier. Thank you for allowing me to participate and to honor a man who was a soldier in every sense of the word. Thank you. I wish there were many people beyond these walls who could hear your insightful remarks. So thank you very much for being with us and sharing the remarks with us. This has been a wonderful afternoon. Thank all of you for helping us honor Secretary Gates and celebrate the life and career of George Catton Marshall. Thanks.